Hey, welcome back everybody. This is the Redstone Warper, and today I'm doing a slightly different kind of video than I've done in the past, where I will be going over how exactly this memory module works that I've worked on iterating from some of those designs over here, all the way to this newest version right over here. Now, at first glance, this looks very complicated, and to some extent it is. Um, keep in mind, I will not be going over my memory tester, which is just in this general area right here. Uh, but I may go over that in the future in a separate video if you guys like. The first part to understanding this memory is we need to understand what exactly is it supposed to do. Memory, in terms of computers, is supposed to store information. Information which is encoded in binary data, ones and zeros. But before we can understand how memory works, we must have at least a simple understanding of binary code. Now, without further ado, let's grab our totals on dying so we don't die at boredom, and let's learn how to count so that we can see the similarities between counting in decimal and counting in binary. So the way we count in binary in our decimal system is by incrementing the ones place one th or zero through nine, before then incrementing the tens place and continuing on through the hundreds and thousands and ten thousands and so on. The way binary works is the same exact way, only instead of being able to go through 0 through 9, we only have 1 to work with. So the way we would count in binary is by going through 1, then skipping over to 2, then going to 3. Now the way to decode or encode binary is pretty simple as follows. The way we would read decimal here is 29. 2 or 20 in the or now 30 in the tens place and 2 over here now in the ones place. The same thing is a little bit different for binary where we add together all of the different values together. So if we take 1 plus 4 we get 5. If we take 5 plus 2 we get 7 and so on and so forth. So any combination of numbers that we flick here we add them together to get 9. So instead of having the ones place, the tens place, hundreds place, we have the ones place, the twos place, the fours place, and the eights place, doubling every time. In this manner, we can also calculate the maximum value stored by a binary number as the number of digits we have squared. So four digits squared is 16 different values, 0 through 15. So uh, now just as a little bit of a demonstration, this is a binary counter. So while this counter is counting in decimal, this one shows you what it looks like to count in binary, where we have 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, where this is the 1's place, 2's place, 4's place, so on, all the way through 64 here. Now that we have a basic understanding of binary, we can now continue to think about how we can store this information as 1's and zeros, or on's and off. And one of the ways to do that is using a flip-flop, and particularly this design that I've created uses a T-flip-flop. So we have a T-flip-flop, which basically when you push the button, the output is on, and when you activate it again, the output is off. And in this manner, we can use a T-flip-flop to encode the binary data that you can see over there in groups of eight or one byte. So these are just all different types of flip-flops. You have rising edge T-flip-flops, falling edge T-flip-flops over there, you also have ones that don't use pistons. Uh, you have uh, probably the one I use the most, um, which creates a one tick pulse, and then the piston spits out this block. Unfortunately, this means that it will only work in Java. Um, this is another T flip flop. But this is all to say that T flip flops come in various different shapes and sizes, and determining which one is best for redstone memory is what leads to a good design using this method. So this is a single cell of my memory device, which starts to look a little bit more complicated than just your standard T flip-flop, but if you look closely, the T flip-flop at its core remains the same. But if we're creating redstone memory, we need a way to access the memory that we want, and not all of the memory at the same time, else it's useless to us. And so we need a way to both send input to the memory, but we also need to stop it from giving input. 
So this represents our input to the bu input bus and to keep it from writing to memory. We just extend mm. this piston, meaning any inputs mm. we send through the bus do not actually get affected by the, the flip-flop, which is actually storing the information. But right now there's a little bit of a problem where it's always writing to the bus. And if all the memory is always writing to the bus, it's just going to be a garbled mess and you're not going to be able to do anything. So we also need to be able to turn our input on and off so that we only read from the memory cells in which we want to read the data from. And lastly, we also need a way to reset the memory so that no matter what state the memory is in, we can reset it to the default state so that we can then unlock the memory and write to the memory again. By now, things are starting to look a little bit more complicated, but really all we've done is stacked our first memory cell over eight times to create one byte. Then we've run redstone wiring so that we can reset all of the bits in the byte at the same time, as well as write the current state to the bus, or to the output bus. We've also wired it up so that the entire input can now be controlled for all eight bits so that we can control them all at the same time. And we have now added the water elevator bus, which is the staple design of my redstone ramp, which allows the signal to propagate up instantly, allowing it for the speed to access every memory cell to remain consistent. Now, unfortunately, due to water mechanics, having them this close together requires that the input to the memory is a little bit more complicated. And what I mean by this is we need to select all of the bits that we want to write and we need to send it all at the same time and do this uh, a little bit of a double pulse here because what happens is if you activate these at slightly different times the water has a chance to recombine creating an infinite water source which then messes up the memory which you're trying to write so by doing this all at the same time and then retracting the water before it has a chance to create an infinite water source we preserve the data and make it so that we don't have issues with the memory corrupting. And so you can see that all of the data has been written over here. And just by enabling these torches, we now can allow the signal to output the memory to the bus. And when we turn it off again, the lights turn off, allowing us to only read and write one memory cell at a time. Now that we understand exactly how we enable and disable the reading and writing of the memory, as well as how to reset it, we must now be able to control exactly one memory module at a time. And so the way we do this is we have two more buses that are connected to the redstone RAM here. The first bus here is the control line. So when this wire is activated, it enables the writing of the data to the bus. When this line is enabled, it resets the memory, and when this one is enabled, it enables the writing to the memory. Now, if we were to just connect just this bus all the way up, we would activate all of the reads and all of the writes of every single cell of memory at the same time, which as we previously discussed, will not help us at all. So, we need a way of selecting which memory circuits are able to be controlled. So, in order to ensure that we only write to one byte at a time, or one address in the memory at a time, we use the addressing bus to give us a combination of numbers which then select one of the address, mapping it so that every single individual combination on the memory bus corresponds to only one chunk in the memory. The way we do this is by using the same water stream as before, we can then activate each individual memory cell. So right now, the system is toggled off by pushing these blocks over the uh, redstone wire here so that the signal gets blocked when it is sent. So if we want to try to reset the memory by pressing this button here, nothing happens because the memory is not selected. Now, if we select the memory, which this in this case is zero because all of the addresses or all of the bits in the address are off, the uh, glass panes then get pushed over the redstone line so that the signal can propagate through. So if we want to enable the read per se, we would enable the read line, and then we can come over here to then write to the memory, and we now have our data preserved here and only here because all of the other addresses in the memory cell will be blocked. 
So then we can come over here and we can disable the right. So if we were to try and come over, if we were to try and send the post again, no changes to the memory will be made because the re or the writing to the memory is disabled. And as predicted, we can now also we can now also write to the bus and get our data out of the memory address all the way to where it needs to go in the rest of our computer. Now that we understand how to select a individual memory cell, we can now stack this one memory cell up 16 times as a 4-bit memory address can store 16 different or has 16 different combinations. The way we program the combinations is through this small little decoder here in which when a redstone block is pushed over but next to a repeater it powers the redstone signal down here and when it powers a torch it turns off. This allows us to select only one piece of memory that is selected off. So currently the zero position in memory is selected and by pushing this button here we can now select the next one at two. So this basically follows the same pattern as when we're counting starting at one or starting at zero, starting going to one, then two, three, four, and so on, allowing us to select only one memory module at a time so that we can actually create a useful memory. One thing you will notice in the design of this memory is by keeping everything on this side uh, in a smaller area, leaving this on uh, leaving the output bus in the very center, we can then flip the memory over, doubling the capacity using one output bus. So instead of having 16 bytes of memory, we can now have 32. And that is where this redstone memory becomes a lot more complicated as you're dealing with all of the circuitry to control each memory address. Because if you simply just wired both input buses to each other, all of the address buses together, as well as the memory control address together, it would just activate both memories at the same time, creating a duplicate value in each pair of cells. Uh, in order to select only one memory cell, we need an extra addressing line. What we do with this is we use the one extra addressing line to then control which side of the memory it controls. So if this is a one, it controls uh, this side of memory. And if it is a zero, it controls this side of the memory. We use the same technique of blocking the red zone signals with solid blocks and letting it pass with glass blocks as we did before with the addressing system for the memory. Only instead, we're using one of the lines to then toggle whether we activate the left or the right side for both the addressing system, the memory control lines, as well as which side the data flows to. So by extending these pistons, it blocks the redstone signal from going down. It gets taken by this repeater and sent over the top row, which goes to that side of the memory. And by retracting the pistons, the memory can... the this repeater is no longer active and the redstone line then gets sucked up by this repeater and continued along the bottom, switching between the left and the right sides. The main reason that I made this redstone switching system is so that instead of having to have five lines running up each side, we can only have four, which also has the benefit that if we wanted to, we could then stack this vertically one more time, just adding one extra control line on the side here and wiring it up. In this way, we could have 64 bytes of memory in the same overall area of footprint, which if I'm remembering correctly for this one is 37 by 31 blocks in area, not including the memory testing machine over here, which I might do a video on later on if you guys want. The biggest complication, however, becomes both the busing system as well as needing to synchronize the writing of memory through the input buses. In this way, we can see that same circuit we showed previously in which we create a Vortec pulse, which then pulses twice to suck up and place the water fast enough so that the infinite water source problem does not apply to the situation. 
In this manner, we also need to be careful in keeping the timings consistent, meaning that the time it takes to get from the beginning here to the end is always the same for every line, so that there are no issues with corrupting the memory. The other main issue with this particular design is because the memory is tiled every one block, we have to do some redstone trickery to kind of canoodle the wires around so that none of the wires cross and go into this one wide tile format while the input is every other block. Another design element which you may notice is that the bubble columns always extend at least one block above the last observer in the chain. This is actually very important if you decide to try to build your own memory because if you do not have this extra block of bubble columns it then corrupts the memory, meaning that the top two pieces of memory are never correctly stored. This took me a long while to figure out what was the issue, and I still don't know exactly why it happened, so if you guys have any ideas, leave them in the comments below. Wow, you made it through the entire video. I guess we didn't need the totem of undying after all. As always, thank you for watching. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe, 